Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, Esotericism, memes, the internet, internet culture, occultism online, whatever else we feel like talking about. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart. I'm jo uh, joined, I'm not joined, I'm joined <laughs> by Jason Memel, one of our many hosts. Hello, Jason. Hello, hello, glad to be here. Uh, and joining us is uh, Chris from Meme Analysis. Hello, Chris. Hello. How do you all do? Ah, we're, we're fantastic. We're happy to have you back on again. I'm assuming this will come out after the one that we recorded with you previously. <laughs> and if it doesn't, then people will be confused. <laughs> but uh, really fascinating topic, really fascinating show. This is part of our Black Iron Prison series, which is completely... Um, free bonus content we don't run it through our patreon it's completely from the good of our hearts uh we're so magnanimous but uh you folks are really going to dig this one it, because you're watching or listening to this that means you use the internet so this might be the most important <laughs> of our programming that you will experience for at least this year uh before i do do that though uh even though we don't run this through the patreon we still can't do the show without your support you can go to patreon.com slash gnostic you can go to paypal.com slash gnostic for one-time donations like share save you know the routine because chances are we're not the only podcast or youtube show that you watch or listen to however don't listen to them and do what they tell you to do if they ask you to give them money or share their show absolutely not unless it's meme analysis um chris people are already guessing from the name of this show from the name of your youtube channel that you anal analyze memes okay but uh internet memes they're when i when people back you know in the early days 10 20 years ago when my parents asked me what a meme is uh, I said it's basically an internet joke. Aren't these just funny things online? So two questions. Why bother analyzing them? And if if there is a reason to analyze them, it's not just a huge waste of your time. What can memes tell us about ourselves and about society? So it's a great question. And I, I have been answering it for a long time because many people, you know, they say, this is just a meme. This is just a joke, bro. You're overanalyzing it. But there's a really important thing. And Lacan points out three integral books by Freud. If you want to be a Freudian, you need to read these three. And he believed that the most important one was Freud's book on jokes yeah. and jokes relation to the unconscious mind. Now, at that time, that was already a far-fetched idea. People were very resistant to the idea that jokes mattered. So is it surprising at all that internet jokes, something that we can see people laughing at because they share them, um, it's a much more public form of comedy than I think jokes that you told friends in the past were. So it's a much more accessible public psychology. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of resistance to the idea that memes matter. But if you accept the basic idea that we speak uh, significant things unconsciously, then jokes which evoke a physical response take on an even greater significance. So, of course, an internet joke matters a lot. A lot of people laugh at it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what can they tell us once, once, once we take them apart? Like when you analyze them, is it just an explanation of here's why the joke works or what what can it tell us about the creators about the the people who are consuming them about the way that they can change because that's of course quite infamous with memes right they can uh transmute from person to person community to community platform to platform so what is it what is it that they're telling us so just like art and all writing it is a unconscious autobiography of the creator mm. and insofar as it is relatable it is a admission of the person who shares it so these memes reveal major unconscious neuroses unconscious complexes and even uh, shared archetypal mythologies that are latent in uh, social discourse right now 
Already you've mentioned, uh, you know, you opened up on the first question, talk about Freud and Lacan. We're already hearing about archetypes. We're hearing uh, about the collective unconscious. So can you tell us, uh, obviously, if you're going to analyze something, you need to use intellectual tools, uh, bodies of thought. Um, what are some of the intellectual tools and the thinkers um, and bodies of thought that you are using to analyze memes? So I have found uh, Carl Jung and Nietzsche to be two of the most important. And then I often also will draw from Aleister Crowley and his reading of the archetypes in the form of the tarot cards and so on. Um, I think he provides, along with Jung and Nietzsche, one of the most um, effective means of analyzing symbolism. Yeah. So I think a lot of people watching and listening um, are both surprised and not surprised by what you just said. One, they're not surprised because this is a show about Gnosticism and the occult, <laughs> so it makes sense. But I, I think a lot of people, okay, if, if they're going to buy your thesis that memes are important, okay, so that's okay, I buy that thesis. Number two, it makes sense that, that we need tools to analyze them then. Okay, so what tools are we going to use? Uh, psycho, um, a psychoanalysis? psychology, philosophy, this makes a lot of sense, I think, if you grab someone off the street, right? Uh, yeah. the, the philosophy, the, yeah, the, I, I could use that to analyze something like a meme. Oh, psychology and psychoanalysis makes sense. But the third one, I, I think, might cause a lot of people to to stop. So using Crowley and using the, the occult to, to analyze memes, isn't the occult a lot different than psychoanalysis and philosophy? a lot different than these critical tools? Um, does it really belong with these critical tools? It is without a doubt identical. Psychoanalysis is occultism, and mm -hmm. occultism in some ways is psychoanalysis. Both are systems of logic aimed at, gr or maybe even systems of non-logic, irrational systems, aimed at grasping nature and human nature, how they relate, and especially in the realm of the unconscious, what we, what we do not know, what is difficult to know, what is hidden from us. It's in the name occult. And one really could have named psychoanalysis, you know, um, kind of a occult analysis, really, crypto analysis and so on, the hidden things, what is hidden away in the psyche. Um, because I th oh, that's one that's one of the things people get wrong now. They think that the psyche is just like out in the open, that you can just kind of look at it and understand it, that it's not hidden, not recessed, but it is. So utilizing occultism, you know, is not surprising at all. Um, anybody who, who understands Jung understands that occultism is a legitimate and truthful approach to the very real phenomena that occupy the world. Yeah. I think for uh, a lot of uh, listeners and viewers of the show, uh, Jung makes a lot of sense. But, you know, I, I'm reading Freud, coming back to Freud, I, I was struck by how similar he is to his occult contemporaries, both in the way that he uses myth, uh, explains how it interacts with humans, uh, the way that he understands the layers of the mind, even, you know, of course I'm reading him in translation, some of his writing style is similar to what I'm seeing in the Golden Dawn or in the French occult revival. Things that are happening at the same time as him. Uh, and I think that would surprise a lot of people. I mean, on one hand, it's not surprising because they are contemporaries, but on the other hand, different languages. And I think a lot of uh, a thought that people think is quite opposed to each other, where I think it makes sense for Jung. That's just an observation that's going almost nowhere, except uh, everybody read jokes in their relation to the unconscious. It's it's quite good. <laughs> um, I also find Freud uh, shockingly readable, um, and that's, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm a great lover of, of Jung, but uh, I, I find that, uh, you know, for, for some of his, particularly the thicker works, uh, they're a bit of a slog. <laughs> so... Um, the okay, okay why and how did you start doing this chris sure so i think i might have i might have mentioned it in the last one or if you're you know if you're a petty viewer it may be internet time traveled to be in the future but i um discovered uh jung and crowley both through music um and freud really i got into philosophy through music through 
Um, they might be giants. They had a song about Socrates and Plato and a song about two songs about the unconscious mind, both of which really like, poof, I got into it. And then the record synchronicity by the police is what got me into Carl Jung because they have a young, they have a young book on the cover and they talk about synchronicity. So, um, one of the, th one of the things that I've considered to be a benefit was not learning about Jung through school. Cause I didn't get into like a very, very normal reduction of his theories to something palatable. I kind of jumped in at the very deepest end, which is synchronicity. Um, and then with Crowley, whose name I, I, I intentionally mispronounce, people are always saying like, oh, he, he doesn't say Crowley. He doesn't, he doesn't actually know Alistair Crowley. I say, no, I pronounce it like David Bowie because I discovered him through David Bowie. Yeah. And I believe also the, the pronunciation that Ozzy Osbourne uses, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And then, so it was, it was Ozzy and Bowie uh, and all, all of those, you know, British artists at the time who were obsessed with them. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So so we, we we got the why, but tell us a bit about the how, right? Like your channel's fairly popular uh, as it should be, and everybody you know go go binge on his channel. Um, the, the the but the, the so you just uh, like like what struck you to to go to YouTube and start uh, taking apart memes like this and really work and build something uh, awesome. So I started the channel. Or I, I made the first meme analysis video when I was 17. Um, and I think it was it was largely inspired by, I, I, I'm a big talker. I love to talk with my friends about these big ideas. And I think it, it came through a vision of the future that I had in which uh, all human communication was accelerated so much that memes were the only the only tool of communication that was left, it was pretty much everything else. Like every war would happen in the course of a minute, you know, governments would change day by day and so on. Um, and I was moved to analyze memes because I, you know, I had seen that nobody else was doing it and I knew that it was a good idea. So my friend and I really just kind of got together and started making the videos, but it took, it took a year at least for any of the videos to get any any views at all but it was worth doing yeah yeah no exactly shaka when the walls fell when all we have left is uh, uh memes um okay so so we already sort of talked about why it's important to understand internet memes but can you go in a little bit deeper about perhaps why it might be essential and why you know People who may not be posting memes every day, love memes, be creating memes, but our internet users, members are, of our society, if you're not meme crazy, why do memes matter to you? If you're not a big internet user, why do memes matter? Uh, can, you, can you dive in a little bit deeper about why society should be and people should be looking at these uh, a little bit deeper? Sure. So, you know, you watch the news every day, or rather you watch the weather channel. You probably check the weather every day. Yeah. You want to see what's going on. Maybe not politically, but you want to see what's going on in terms of the weather. You want to know how hot it is. Is it going to be raining? What's going on? Memes are that kind of thermometer or barometer. If you can effectively analyze them, they are a tool to understand the psychic weather. The collective unconscious of any given state, country, and so on can be read through the memes that are being shared. Uh, they tell us the most. You know, you can't you can't trust what is said with intention. You need to look at the unconscious speech to actually grasp the meaning of things. Um, and I actually wanted to speak a bit to that connection that you made before, like why does Freud sound so much like the occultists of his time? And I think that the really important connection here, which will again, for people who, who dig philosophy, but maybe don't un, uh, they don't agree that memes have any significance, um, Eliphas Levi was greatly influenced by Schopenhauer. Mm -hmm. And so the likeness between Levi and Freud is very unsurprising because they're both essentially Schopenhauerians and proto Nietzscheans, or, you know, if you believe Freud kind of just directly plagiarized Nietzsche, but you are getting two visions of the world as will. And 
all of all of whom were very focused on the role that symbols played, especially symbols that were infectious, that affected the will. And memes are precisely that symbol. I think very few would disagree that memes are at least symbols. They might disagree as to symbols of what, but I think that I pretty effectively show that they are just like magical symbols. They are symbols of the unconscious, of archetypes. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we live in a, a time where every interest, both deep and not deep, um, have communities online, meaning they're generating their own memes, often taking almost never from scratch, right? Often taking a template or a pop culture idea, transforming it. And, you know, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be fun to, to send some occult memes, specifically occult memes to Chris to analyze? But I, this is both a question and an observation. I'm just, you know, swimming out here without a life jacket, not knowing how to swim. So excuse me as I ramble. But can we actually get more out of a non-occult meme than we can with an occult meme, if I'm making sense? Because the occult meme is very deliberate, right? You're often referencing something that is uh, at least a, even though the idea may not be concrete, it is still a concrete idea within occultism. Is it, am, I making, am I making any sense in this riff? Absolutely. I think, you know, that is what some people would call a forced meme. Yeah. Like a meme about the occult or a meme about any given field, it's going to appear very forced, especially if it is like kind of um, seizing a format and demanding it serve this idea. So I think that can be very, very lame. Um, whereas I find that there are major occult trends in popular memes and then to give a kind of an opposite side to the forced meme, there are memes about fields that are so esoteric to the person looking at the meme that it becomes funny because it's surreal. Um, it's like a surreal enjoyment because it's, it's you know, uh, what, what's the word? It's indecipherable. So that can make it funny. But there, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give a good quick example of a occult meme that's not like, pr probably wasn't made by an occultist. Or maybe it was, but either way, it's a very good example of a, of a very strong occult meme. And it's Baphomet with the up and down and the up and down it's a uh, WD 40 and duct tape for solve <laughs> at coagula. I haven't actually like, seen this that is one. Real. This is good. This is practical. You, <laughs> you, you, exp you, we are, when we use WD 40 and duct tape, we are engaging in alchemy. That is the kind of good, good occult meme. Yes. I will. Uh, uh, I will take a moment to hype Gnostic Problems, our friend at Gnostic Problems, who is uh, makes very good Gnostic memes. Um, but I'll definitely be sending the show to them. Uh, hopefully, they'll post it on the Gnostic Problems <laughs> uh, page. But everybody, check that out for good Gnostic memes, uh, and send us your favorite occult memes as well. <laughs> we'll post them underneath the show or do something with them on our pages. Um, and now I'm going to have to find that that Baphomet one. But yes, I, I agree with you, uh, and I think you really articulated both what I was thinking and trying to say force force means uh and i have encountered many of those particularly when it comes to to occultism um okay so uh jason jason is having some tech problems the archons have gotten into his they've, they've taken possession of his computer um but uh, we'll try to exercise them uh, uh jason reaching out to you in the digital pleroma knock twice if you can hear me knock knock perfect perfect <laughs> Um, I'm sorry for the for the tech glitches here today. Um, the uh, well, one thing that I've been been uh, really fascinated by is the 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 this element of both the way memes can mutate, but also the, how much memes represent a, a sense of um, uh, uh, un like unmediated uh, 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 participation. Like that, it's not there's nobody saying like, okay, here's the right meme, and you have to do it this way. It's it's just people trying things, you know, and some things get successful. And um, so I guess, uh, uh, I don't know, like, I, yeah, I'm just saying I'm fascinated maybe in that, in that point. And maybe if there's anything that that sparks for you in terms of both the occult elements we've been talking about and the non. Um, one thing that did strike me just as I was listening was that the idea of a, that occult memes are often, as you say, very specific and it's almost 
like the fact that you know what it means is your bonding principle to the community. Whereas, whereas uh, uh, some of the wider memes don't require you to be part of a club, if that makes sense. Or the, the, the club is your ability to laugh, simply. Like if you can do that, you're good. Um, so yeah, again, not really a question, but I guess like, is there anything, anything that, that sparks in terms of, of uh, uh, how you're seeing in, in terms of the, the importance of memes? Sure. So I think that that speaks to like layers of relatability because there are memes that are funny because it's like um, like a good example. I don't know if either of you use tarot cards, but I think the best tarot card meme I ever saw, it was like it's like the strong, the strong dude picking up the kid. And it's the and the tarot deck is the strong dude. And it's like, didn't you already ask me that question? And a lot if you you know, if you if you use tarot cards, you know, either you ask the same question again and again, trying to get the right answer the answer you want, or that other people do the same, always coming to you to try and get the good answer. Um, so that is, a, it's funny, but it, it does require a degree of, a, a further degree of relatability. And I think that, you know, they can be good, but I think the most effective memes, which is the most virulent, they could be relatable to anybody. They could be relatable to all of us. Um, and then as for like, you know, memes changing all the time, I think it is largely superficial. Um, Jung talks about the necessity of a symbol to be unassailable. Mm. So the archetypal energy that you know Ill, that uh, animates a given symbol, it needs the best possible vessel at all times. And as soon as that given meme or that given symbol is uh, dulled, it you know, throws it away and moves on immediately. Memes are the same way. The minute that a format is useless, it is dropped and it's remorseless. Um, occasionally though, if it's a really powerful format, it will come back, it can be reanimated. And I think that is the sign of a really significant archetypal presence. Like if, uh, like Doge or the troll face. Doge is a really good example because it's, it's, it's moved not just in the realm of memes, but into the realm of cryptocurrency, and it's still super effective, still super popular. Yeah. That is one to pay attention to. Yeah, precisely. Um, I, I wonder, um, you know, in, in some of the material in uh, Freemasonry and and Martinism, you know, uh, the, the two the, which come with uh, conventicles, uh, lectures, um, uh, teachings that are usually the same across uh, uh, different uh, lodge lines, uh, but they they talk about in both of those systems early on uh, symbols, right? There, there's a lot of a lot of ink spilled and a lot of words thrown around about symbols. And in those systems, uh, a symbol. So I'm just asking if you, if you agree. I guess a symbol is arch. Okay, what most people think a symbol is is uh, usually something visual that represents something else. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, where uh, this material I'm referencing talks about a symbol is an archetype that uh, is in and of itself something else, right? And it's, it's not a visual that is standing in for something else. It is its own complete energetic system. So, so we can't talk about means without talking about symbols. What, what, do you agree of a perspective more like that or, or how do you understand it? I would say it's more like a fingerprint. Yes, it is the thing but it is simultaneously a sign for the thing. It's a living thing. The symbol is living, but it's also uh, kind of kind of a part of a bigger living thing. I don't think that an archetype can be fully contained within a symbol. Yeah. The symbol is always a mediator between the one perceiving it and the thing that animates it, the thing that it represents. So I would I would disagree as to a kind of a, what a symbolic transubstantiation. No, if you know, I don't think that the cross is Christ. The cross is a major part of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, uh, what is libido? So libido, I would say, like we were talking Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Freud. It's all the same thing. They're all when they describe will and love we are talking about two forms of drive and libido is the creative and i would say honestly that will is is uh, closer to the destructive the 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 closing in versus the uh, breathing out and 
which is, you know, again, essentially like yin and yang within the Tao. We get these dual energies, these animating principles, and essentially, you know, that you get you get God there. Then you get cherubs. You get the elemental uh, explications of that initial uh, force, and then you know you get gods and beings and so on, going on and on and on and on and on. But those emanations are the archetypes. The archetypes are segmented bits of libido. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think too, you know, you mentioned uh, 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 love and will, uh, and as well as Freud. Um, I, I think once you explain things like this, both to occultists and non-occultists, they understand this concept a, a lot better, right? It's not just being horny. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, all all things that are pleasurable are sex. All that is all that is desire is sex. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about what I'm asking about libido? So, what does that have to do with with internet memes? So, all symbols are animated by libido, and the internet has, from its very onset, been a locale where symbols are how we communicate. Um, you know, emojis, emotes, the various memes, and um, what are they called? Like, and uh, excuse me, what is what is this word? Like, for CIA, FBI, acronym? Yeah, acronyms. Acronyms, acronyms are symbols too. Um, and the and all the internet geeks, they speak in this code. They speak in a symbolic language, and the internet is built up of these symbolic languages, these codes. And then the people who use the internet, who, who share things to the internet, they engage in symbolic communication as well. So the fact that the internet is a receptacle and something that is formed by libido is, uh, I, don't, I don't really think a, a very controversial take, you know? We, we made the internet, like you said, based on our interests, based on desires. The internet is formed by desire. Mm. We're going to come back to that, that's for sure. But because we're talking about the, the internet, so the word meme, uh, of course, predates the internet as we know it, right? It's not originally describing funny pictures online. Uh, so is there something special about internet memes as opposed to other memes? You know, I, I am personally not a fan of Dawkins. I, I don't think that Dawkins provides a truthful look at what a meme is. I am far... And because he, you know, he was originally critiqued as um, describing something that was too close to archetypes. Yeah. And then I think with William S. Burroughs, we get a far more suitable vision uh, in the form of the word virus or the image virus. So, you know, internet memes, when looked at through a Burroughsian lens, I think are far more legible. He, even back back in the 70s, is describing you know, deadly recorded sounds and deadly recorded images combined and played in public to induce a state of mind or an emotion or a physical feeling. You know, he, he is already looking at the internet meme far before the internet, whereas Dawkins cannot even imagine such a thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Okay, so uh, coming back to, to desire. So uh, both me and Jason, uh, we Actually, are interested in... Oh, go ahead, Jason. Sorry, yeah, I, I, I'm interested in where you're about to go, but I just, the Burroughs thing, uh, there's also, I guess, I think like, because so much of memes, like right now, the, the popular one is the Anakin Padme meme um, that I'm seeing so much of, uh, but that people are doing all kinds of editing, which going back again to the Burroughs thing has kind of a cut up sensibility. Um, this idea of like, if I if I put these things that weren't normally together, I can create a different story, a different experience, but using the same rhyming structure, you know? Um, Absolutely. I think that the experience of cut up, it, it's remarkable because it's so it's so normal now. Like we, I think you know, you like you were just saying, you're going to edit this. That's that's crazy. It, we are at a time where the most people ever are editing. 
editing visuals and sounds. There was a point where that was just film producers, music producers, and so on. Like that was not a normal thing that people did. And to take a book and cut it up, unimaginable. Or even to take, you know, to take a, a comic book and cut it up. Like some people would collage, of course. But that was, you know, a surrealist, a Dadaist practice that was already a really deeply challenging spiritual practice. The fact that it is now integrated fully into cultural humor through memes, I think it's like brilliant. You know, it's, it's what an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, it just reminds me of uh, going back, uh, you know, what we call in Canada junior high, probably grade seven, grade eight. But I, I remember a friend being kind of upset and like asking what I thought because he, he knew I was a writer that finding out that David Bowie used uh, Burroughs cut up method. For, for lyrics because he, he felt like oh that was that was cheating you know that that's not too create that's not true creativity how can it be right you have to sit down with intention and make uh, structured lyrics so um, I'm not saying anything of that except cut up method rules um, and um, uh, well, and okay. uh, I mean how uh, like no writer even if they're not using cut up is 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 not thinking of other texts as they write you know. Yes. So even if there's not like actually scissors and, and glue, there's like, there's going like, I'm gonna take bits that I like from this. I'm gonna take bits that I like from that. Um, so, so yeah, your friend was wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course, you know, uh, writers, good writers, novelists, traditional novelists, uh, Iowa, w Iowa workshop uh, uh, writers, my least favorite kind of writer, um, are, are going to construct <laughs> novels with lots of themes, man, uh, that resonate. But what's quite interesting is, is what's more interesting for me, of course, is looking at fictional works and the structures and the themes that perhaps the writer was not aware of, writer does not want to admit, which uh, all the great artists go back and, and discover, you know, famously Philip K. Dick, who went back and reread his old books and uh, found Gnostic themes in, in biblical stories that he did not mean to put in there, right? That were mm -hmm. uh, bubbling up from someplace, someone, somewhere else. Um, okay, back to the, the question I was going to ask. So yes, Jason sorry. and I both have... Oh, no, please. Your question was awesome. So um, uh, Jason and I both have an interest in marginism, which I won't bother explaining because we've done multiple shows on it. So I'll link it up in the, uh, in the show notes. Uh, in modernism, one aspires to become an homme de désir, uh, a, a man of desire, or perhaps I should be saying person of desire. Okay. So when we were talking about this, uh, Jason found the term desire off-putting, but I love it. Uh, Chris, can you riff a bit about desire and how the term is used both in Freud and Lacan and in the occult? So I think we get really two opposing visions of desire between Lacan and what I would say really is the more Freudian view because it's, you know, you get Reich and then Deleuze names it uh, productive desire versus Lacan's view of desire from lack. So I think, you know, if you believe in, in God, God is the productive desire itself, productive energy the thing that moves us. So the desire from lack could almost really even be more easily understood as death drive. It's the thing that is constricting, the thing that is grasping, that is trying to close around rather than the thing that is endlessly pushing out and endlessly uh, expanding. So for one to be like God, one needs to be creative. Creativity is our likeness to God. And when you are a creative person, you are like God. When you are not a creative person, you are not. You are nothing like God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. And I think that is why uh, in that system, they particularly use that term uh, desire uh, because of some of the connotations that you're, that, that you're talking about. And of course, understanding the, the divine uh, itself, right? Particularly in the, the Valentinian Gnostic myth in the Gnostic myths and the Kabbalistic myths, you know, why does God create? God creates out of desire. <laughs> um, God desires to have something to love, right? And only through uh, creating a hole in itself, creating a little bit of space, can it have something that is separate from itself, but hey, is also still connected. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting just finding some of these repeated patterns 
uh, and act as stuff that is disparate, right? Because um, the tree of life in Kabbalah, uh, the in some Kabbalistic systems, the the pillar of mercy, each of the Sephiroth on the pillar of mercy, uh, mercy would endlessly expand. Um, their their pure desire, their pure expansion, and if it wasn't for the Sephiroth on the um, I'm not using the the, uh, the plural or the singular right on the on the pillar of severity, then the Sephiroth on the pillar of uh, mercy would overtake the entire universe. So they're actively limiting, actively setting barriers. Uh, so here we have uh, desire and its negation, but it's needed for creation. And, you know, this sounds a lot like some of what Freud says, right? It sounds a lot about, like, what some of these philosophers and thinkers from this time are saying about both will and desire, libido and orgone. And to uh, kind of see it popping up in all these places. Now, of course, occultists are sort of infamous for making connections that perhaps are kind of weak, maybe a little bit of creative, <laughs> maybe maybe slamming together a bunch of disparate parts of systems and saying that they're all the same thing. Yeah, I, I think that is a pretty common and, and not without its um, use as criticism. But I really think that this is a comparison that is unavoidable, um, reflected through all these different systems. I'm a big believer in comparative systems. Uh, it's, I think that, honestly, and this might just be like, you know, I am, I am a horrid, horrid, severe Westerner, but I truly do believe that if it is unable to be synthesized, if, if there is not a singular, unconscious, true system that can be derived from all systems, we are hopelessly lost. I cannot accept that there is just one correct um, school and that all the others are based on nothing, that there's no similarities. There must be a synthesis. There must be a shared system. Yeah. Yeah. And before I move on from desire, an easy question for you. Uh, why does desire desire its own suppression? <laughs> it is a question. This is, and this is when we get into like heaven and hell, uh, energy and reason. And perhaps even time and space. Um, energy desires its own suppression the way that a bow wills its being drawn. It needs to be drawn to achieve its purpose. Will, desire, love, they need to be repressed to draw itself and to launch itself beyond. To achieve its greatest potential it needs to it needs to um be repressed and this is something that nietzsche talks about beautifully just the necessity of a collective repression for the greater transformation yeah yeah well i think of the the sufi saying um uh, god says uh, i'm a treasure who hid myself so i can be discovered right mm -hmm. heraclitus you know nature likes to hide um, um go ahead one thing that uh, uh just to, to to, to note that I, why I found desire off-putting is probably because um, a lot of the, the ways in which I'd encountered the uh, desire was not in any kind of um, the idea of it being attached to a creative impulse was not was not present in a lot of how I'd encountered that word and phrase. Um, and in fact, to say somebody to say a man of desire or a man or a person of desire almost makes it sound like going back to the tarot card, like uh, the uh, the tarot cards, uh, the devil card you know, uh, being trapped by desire, being trapped by especially material desire. Um, uh, so that's, I think, what I found, uh, just to kind of note where the, where the, um, my disconnect came from is like, I think I, I have a much bit greater sense of it now that from this conversation, even, even conversations we've had, uh, John and I have had prior, but, but I think uh, there's also maybe something here going back to the, some of what we've been talking about, about cut-ups, restructuring, evolution, and, and, um, uh, uh, what, what am I trying to say here? Uh, like, uh, yeah, just transformation of, of words and symbols and, and stories is that, yeah, that like I, I was kind of coming up against uh, my own versions of those and then bumping, in, bumping into uh, sort of a, a school that is using it in, in a different way. So I think that's kind of an interesting, that's like seeing a meme that you don't quite get the joke of, you know, like you think you know why that's there, but like, why is this funny? <laughs> That makes sense. And, then, and it can eventually become funny after you've, mm -hmm. after you've, you know, adjusted. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, I definitely had that question in there, not not just for your sake, Jason, because I think most <laughs> people in the West, uh, most people interested in spirituality are going to hear that word desire and have similar connotations. And, and part of that, too, is is both from, you know, Christian heritage, right? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people, if they're interested in esotericism in the West, are, are going to run up against Buddha, uh, Buddhism and Buddhist concepts, right? Particularly if you do basically any kind of meditation, even if it's completely removed from a Buddhist Sangha. Uh, where, and this isn't the best translation though, but the word, uh, you know, craving is much better. Um, mm. uh, you know, where the word desire is often one of the translations used for the things that, you know, keep us tangled up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then what I will say is that the enjoyment of the material desires can be a source of enlightenment as well. Of course. Um, you know, I shouldn't when, say of course, but it's when not we look that at obvious. You, uh, but yes, I concur. <laughs> Please continue. Like with the tarot card, the devil, you know, you, you see he, he is kind of the ultimate creative card. The magician manipulates, but the devil is the creative one. He is, because it's like it's a phallus, it's literally in the Thoth tarot. He is a, he's a, a penis. The devil <laughs> image forms a penis. It's the ultimate it, yeah, creative. Crowley is known for his being subtle. Yeah, Ex exactly. Like we, you know, he is very his sigil is that of a penis because it's all about the creativity that material can evoke. You know, we cannot cut ourselves off from the material to create. Yes, mm -hmm. and and you know, and and there is lots of uh, uh, it, it's. Uh, Lots of uh, spiritual systems related specifically to to Jason and I and to other people within our communities and people in our orbits um, that, that that do teach that right and of course Crowley with with Philema with Philiba is, is one of the uh, maybe best known examples in these circles but I think also Vajrayana um, uh, you know the, uh, the uh, tantric Buddhism uh, which is not just about sex but is uh, about using uh, materiality and your emotions and everything in this world as a drive towards. Uh, enlightenment. Um, our uh, our ancient, some of our ancient Gnostic ancestors, Gnosticism was a very diverse uh, group of sects, and some of them were ascetics, right, denying the body and denying the urges, um, and some of them seemed to be uh, quite the opposite. <laughs> the idea of being that you had to you had to experience every pleasure and every pain there is in the world to move on from the world. So, um, I, but I, 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 it's still a very powerful um, cliche stereotype uh, that, that these things are completely opposed to each other, right? Even in a very, uh, in my opinion, hedonistic and uh, decadent 21st century. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, Chris, uh, so actually talking about that, hey, that goes right in well with my next question. So the occult, uh, like witchcraft, occultism in all sorts of different forms, uh, therapy, uh, at least uh, if not actually going to therapy, but therapeutic concepts and language, and just the whole idea of discovering your true self. All these things are extremely in right now. But this is just me personally speaking, both of you can disagree. I, I feel like the vast majority of our society, the vast amount of people, and I'm not speaking from on top of the hill, myself included, are blundering around as strangers to themselves. They don't know themselves. They don't know why they do things. <laughs> and they're caught up in layers of illusion. Uh, and this seems counter um, intuitive to me because of the things that I just said are trendy and in right now. So the, the Chris, uh, the, and, and as well as you, Jason, what do you think? Am I completely off base uh, that, that people are blundering around not knowing who they are and why they're doing things? Uh, is it just a hiccup that I have? Or what do you think is going on? Uh, I'll let the guest go first, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think that we failed in the 1960s. I think we got like the cliffothic form of the 1960s. We had all the right thinkers, all the right forces, and we we messed it up completely. And so it's not surprising that we would continuously misunderstand those thinkers that so greatly informed <laughs> the greatest social movement in the Western, I guess, in, in our, in kind of our, the 20th century, or I guess late 20th century, but you know, we totally messed it up, totally messed it up. If we had taken the popular thinkers of that time and done it right, I think that we probably would still be interested in the things we are now, but we'd be doing it correctly. 
So I think it's it's a just part of a line, part of a tradition of misunderstanding the right stuff. Um, and likely a lot of it is due to other other harmful myths and blockages in the psyche that prevent a a full reckoning with the meaning of the things that they proclaim themselves to believe. Much of it has been reduced to aesthetic, unfortunately. But as I said in the last one, like these are necessary and good because they will produce the thing that works. You know, yeah. we are we are getting enough people interested. Some of them will understand it, and from there, you know, we can we can get ahead. Yeah, Jason, I'll let you riff in a sec, but uh, it's just so scary <laughs> how uh, Chris is inside of my head uh, because I have very <laughs> similar feelings uh, about about the '60s and uh, and and what what went right and most importantly what went wrong. I I'm also reminded of uh, there's an idea in some of the Rosicrucian uh, sects. Um, that uh, there's a cycle of 108 years, 118 years, 100 years, it depends on the tradition, where things can go very right or very wrong, right? It's, it's a pivotal shift, and uh, either teachings will spill out, and, you know, we may not have utopia, but we will have uh, a really great time, right? <laughs> or uh, because it is this liminal... Uh, 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 time, this liminal space, this turning of the wheel, it's also uh, a, a time with the potential for things to go extremely wrong, right? And, you know, people who have this belief or uh, are interested in it, I don't know if I literally believe it, I don't know if I literally believe anything, to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> I don't even know what that word means anymore. Uh, the, I, I, I just find that to be a, uh, a fun idea, right? And obviously the, the, the turning the, uh, of the cycle does unleash the um, uh, both positive and negative, and then it's which it's up to humans which which one is going to be dominant till the next cycle. That's a better way of explaining it, right? So the good stuff does get out, but it gets pushed down. Anyways, I think that's a cool idea. Um, uh, Jason, <laughs> do, do you got riffs? Do you, do you want to lay down some some tracks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, this is a DJ memo here. Um, yeah. uh, that's I should stop right there because I have no rhythm, um, but. The, uh, the I think the one thing that I get nervous about is assuming uh, the experience of a wide range of people to be one thing or another. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, for those of you listening to the podcast, it says DJ Memo on the screen right now. Um, but uh, so I think like I I think I can both see that there that there there, there has been something lost. There's been opportunities that we missed. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, um, progress to catch up with. Uh, but I also think that there are, there is a kind of experience that's out there. Um, like I, I think about my, my stepfather when I think about this kind of thing, um, as far as I can tell someone who, uh, didn't really have much of a religious impulse or a uh, spiritual impulse in any way, but, um, like I would call him as enlightened as anybody, like his, the way he treated the people around him and, uh, the, um, the 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 life he lived, the the example he left for me, um, in its simplicity. I think there's a uh, to, to presume that because he hasn't been practicing a uh, uh, a, a sort of a, a practice to inoculate himself or or um, fight back against any kind of uh, oppressive uh, nature, to to presume that his demographic would be then susceptible uh, at, in a broad brush. I think I get nervous about that. I think. Um, uh, so, like, I think much like much like a, a binary politics, I think there's probably the bulk of people are living somewhere in the middle and have have pinpricks of experience that uh, in one direction or the other, um, either being trapped by something or liberated by something. But that, um, so yeah, like I think I think I'm a little less ready to to presume those kinds of uh, um, cycles. I think and uh, and those kinds of structures. Um, I mean, I honestly, I believe in the in the power of of uh, you know art and and the occult and everything to try to create um, an experience that that can do more for the world. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But I think um, I, I just get nervous when we when like because I think I think they, it, it, we can start to think that because we now know these things, we are somehow uh, uh, elite. Frankly, uh, uh, and then somebody like my stepfather. Uh, is sort of left behind in that kind of, in that narrative, I would say, or like not even considered. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense there in terms of my riffing. 
No, I, I think so. And, and I do agree with you in that if you're having some of these concepts and ideas, you do have to be careful because everything can be discovered, right, without having to read a bunch of books or know a bunch of concepts, right? You don't need to read Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche to know uh, what Nietzsche knows, uh, hypothetically, right? Um, so uh, I, I do agree with you, Jason. And as, as somebody who um, recently wants to burn down all the universities, I, I would say to <laughs> having uh, uh, some very stereotypical ideas about what knowledge is and how you accumulate it um, can be can be dangerous, right? Um, as well as um, uh, the importance of adopting certain perspectives um, to uh, uh, and the necessity to adopt a, a certain um, perspective and making other people adopt a certain perspective. So uh, yeah, I'm just riffing and you know. Uh, talking uh, uh, about things that uh, that I that people can pick up that I don't want to uh, talk about on a show about religion. So <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I, I, I would say many people are natural, naturally good. There, yeah. there is no need for any spirituality. But I suppose you know the the figure that I'm focused on is like the kids who saw that there were hippies forming and became a hippie. The people who are not, you know, acting of their own goodness or even of their own badness, but are just going mm -hmm. with collective flows. Mm -hmm. That is where these cycles are apparent. So it's not to say that like everybody was that way, but that there, but there is undoubtedly a subsect of people who follow generational patterns. Mm -hmm. But I, of mm -hmm. course, not everybody. Yeah. And this is just the like I, I know I'm uh, belaboring it, but I guess that's uh, and like I think. I think the uh, like because I guess I'm kind of going back to John's initial question about like um, you know uh, the vast majority of society blundering around, and I think like this. I guess my thing is I think like it's so hard to know what's inside someone else's head, you know. That's like the great work right there is just trying to communicate from one mind to another. <laughs> um, uh, that that to preclude what's in that head is I think um, like we can or maybe to put it another way maybe in a in a in a scientific way or an analytical way, we can document the the the, um, the flight patterns, but we can't know what's in the bird's heart, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if I'm if I'm belaboring my point too much here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can only uh, uh, at, at the same time, right? You, when you're talking about quote unquote society, you can only talk about mm -hmm. in generalities. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so there's yeah. going to be some lots and lots of uh, of um, exceptions to uh, to any uh, huge generalization like that. However, this does actually lead into a question that I didn't have on the sheet. Sorry, Chris, but of course, you know, you know that they pop up. You've done lots of podcasts, <laughs> but um, the. Uh, we talked uh, 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 about uh, uh, another project that you're doing, uh, uh, Aeonic Comics. So everybody check out that show. I'll link it. Everybody buy a couple copies. Uh, Aeoniccomics.bigcartel.com. But do you believe in the new Aeon, that a new Aeon has begun or is in the processes of beginning? Because this is an idea, talking about memes, that I find quite fascinating because you find it, um, and, and of course, these are interrelated influences for the most part, but you find it in all sorts of places over the last 120, 150 years, right? You find it in the Gnostics of the late 1800s. They believed that a new age was beginning. Um, of course, you have the hippies with the phrase new age. Uh, most famously, you have uh, uh, Crowley, Crowley uh, talking about the new aeon. Uh, and you actually hear it from the Buddhists in the West. Uh, so, uh, yeah, do, do, you, do you believe that this is the beginning of a new aeon? And then what does that mean to you? Yes, I would say, I would say absolutely. And but in, I guess in a secondary point, it doesn't even matter if there is. What matters is that it is a very significant liberatory ideal. Right. Um, mm. It's a far more suitable religion and system to progress humanity through, to advance the individual and to advance our station in life through a belief in a kind of new aeon rather than believing in a, a regressive one. Many people, you know, they make it a, a miserablest acceleration. We are accelerating toward destruction, toward the end, rather than toward uh, a point of advance. So, yes, I, I do believe in it. And also that it, it plays a very powerful symbolic role. 
so we can help bring in the new Aeon by sharing memes about the new Aeon, because even if it's not real, we can make it real. <laughs> exactly, but me memes themselves are a definite a, a sign of the Aeonic shift, you know, the advancing of communication to that point. You know, much of the technological mm. advancement points to the progression that is occurring. That's what I would say. Mm. And also why I'm so fascinated in getting the internet right why I focus on a lot of the kind of collective neuroses and the problems online is because the internet can be a really powerful, positive tool rather than a weapon and a trap. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. There's a, a highly, the, if I can remember, I'll link them up. I always hang on to link stuff in the show notes and don't, but I'll, I'll link at least, you know, 50% of what we talked about. But uh, there's, there's now a whole genre of documentaries that's talking to the internet uh, and online utopians from the, from the 90s and the early 2000s. That's just them being super sad. Just being like, I was all about the internet because I thought it was going to change the entire world, right? For the, be for the better. Uh, you know, you're Douglas Rushkoff's and, and what have you. Uh, and anyway, so it's a whole genre a documentary now and then, and then the, the, of them just talking about what they used to believe and then being very sad about what the internet has become um so i am glad that uh there are people out there keeping the um uh keeping the the, the fire alive uh for the uh the impact of this uh, uh technology um chris what meme surprised you with its depths once you kind of thoroughly picked it apart uh it's one of the simplest memes that i've ever seen it was a rage comic, and it's just a, a, a kind of smiling face, a kind of smirking face, and a peach, and the text, peach time. <laughs> peach time, I think, is, one of, is, is honestly one of the most impressive, because of how simple it is. It's only maybe four things, two words and two images. And I think it, it mirrors a Taoist god perfectly. There is the god Sao, the god of longevity, and he eats peaches. He eats the peaches of immortality. They are what give him the cure to time. It is literally peach time. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, what are, what's your favorite meme, your favorite one, or some of your favorite memes, period? Uh, I like there are memes that have isopods in them, and I think the role of isopods in memes is very, very good. Um, they're very, they're symbolic, but they're very funny. They're very cute. There's, there's a good one. I don't know what the names are because there's like all the like trilobites and isopods and all these different names for these, these creatures, but I like them all. I love them all. And one of them, it's just a creature swimming and it says, embrace love. But there's one eating another creature and it said, a boy's got to eat, a boy's got to have his supper. And we are, we are seeing the drives because if we like, you know, we use Dali and Satra and the tarot, you know, the, the crab or the crustacean is a symbol of the unconscious. It is the archaic, the archaic life form. And that's, we know that about the, like, uh, like horseshoe crabs are like one, one of the oldest surviving species. So, you know, we are inter interacting directly with the unconscious when we interact with crustaceans. So I'm always very fascinated <laughs> by how they act in memes, because it's like our, our great ancestor. Yeah, yeah. Cons consider that lobster. Um, the, uh, <laughs> consider the lobster. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, on your point, and uh, th this is trivia that, that I think is deep, but uh, crabs, are, crabs are infamous for uh, unrelated um, um, uh, genius, gen genuses, on, on related DNA streams of creatures evolving into crabs. You leave everything alone long enough, we all turn into crabs. That'll be the future of human beings, the crabs. So they're both, they're both primal and the end point. Um, and because that is the form that you, that, um, that animal life can take so easily, you're right, so primal, right? And I think there is actually something deeper about, like, you know, like, you know, cancer and crabs, right? Like why we call that disease cancer. It's not just because it looks like crab pinchers, right? It, it is us dealing with this primor primordial body horror. <laughs> um, not, to uh, mention, uh, not to mention that they generally move sideways. Yes. That's yeah, no, yeah, you're getting into creepy, like, creepy, like, yeah. Japanese horror movie shit then, right? Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, anyways, you can come back for crab talk 
Um, that'll be the sequel to this episode. Uh, okay, <laughs> we are rolling up to the end. Uh, uh, Jason, do you have uh, follow-up questions? Any more riffs? Anything at all before before we get into yeah. the the, uh, the home run? I think uh, uh, the, the question I was thinking a lot about before we started the show was: um, Have there been like uh, have you found that being involved in meme discourse? Um, how do I put it? Like, uh, like, like, is it easy? Or, like, is it hard to keep an anthropological distance? If that makes sense, or are you like immersed in it? Uh, like, a, you know, from a like journalism perspective, like an embedded journalism versus a, a distanced one. And um, have you found anything that that has, from the interaction of meme creators, of people on your Discord, of people just on YouTube, uh, and just in general? Um, have you found any developments in your understanding of a particular meme or memes in general that came from that 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 cyclical discourse or that continual discourse? You know, I think if I were more embedded, my channel would be far more popular. I I really only come to memes very very late because I am not really involved with it, so I miss out on like the most popular point of a meme, which is when it gets the most views. So no, I am not embedded. But what I do find, you know, I, I look at what trends, what bits of my videos do well. YouTube has this cool thing where it shows you like spikes and continuous viewership in videos. It shows you the most viewed parts. So I can pick up on like what, what is unconsciously significant. What is significant to these people that I write about? Which memes are the most impactful on them? And I will take that information to make other videos that are more impactful. So I'm definitely informed by the interaction with the audience. Extremely cool. Um, well, it is uh, wrap up time. Uh, Chris, if you could give us uh, uh, give us your plugs. All right. Uh, so if the podcast is not yet, you know, check out Aonic Comics on Instagram. Uh, check out Meme Analysis and perhaps even more exciting, check out memeanalysis.com for a look at my mythological framework of the internet, which I would say is a, a Gnostic framework. Ooh, okay. Very, very exciting. Well, we're definitely going to check that out, and I bet you all of our listeners and viewers will as well. Uh, Jason, do you have any, uh, any plugs? Uh, not any plugs other than just trying to, to uh, uh, live through this heat wave. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to say on behalf of you, go to jasonmemel.com. Why not? Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. What else are you doing today? Go to jasonmemel.com after going to memeanalysis.com. <laughs> um, my plugs are myledmeditation.substack.com off for the summer but normally every Sunday morning both in person if you're in Montreal or online we it's hybrid we do both um, secular open meditation for everybody good for both uh, experienced and new meditators uh, come on anytime uh, myledmeditation.substack.com and uh, I think that's about it uh, Chris uh, uh, thanks so much. It's been incredibly, amazingly awesome. So uh, everybody go check out Chris's work and um, we will uh, make a hundred forced memes about this episode. Okay, everyone. Bye.